Subprime Evil, Season 3, Episode 5, Divided We Fall, Part 1, written by Robert S.C. Cutler, read by Fentress O. Moore. Craig and Don Chester crept west toward Salina, Kansas, on Interstate 70 on their way to pick up Don's mother. The average speed since they left Topeka rarely breached more than 15 miles an hour. Traffic on both sides of the freeway had been packed since the evacuation order was given. In some spots, people were getting out of their vehicles, walking and stretching, some playing frisbee and catch while the traffic was at a standstill. Marie Halstead, Don's widowed mother, had shuttered herself inside of the small bungalow she had called home for the past 40 years, ignoring orders from the National Guard and pleas from neighbors to evacuate. She had too many memories in that old house to leave it vulnerable to vandals and looters. It took nearly six hours of negotiating back and forth for Dawn to finally convince her mother that it was a good idea to leave. A wedding portrait of Marie and her late husband Wayne, both just 19 years old and clueless, had hung over the fireplace since the day they moved in. Over the years, the portrait was joined by pictures of their four children and seven grandchildren, chronicling their lives on the mantle from newborn to weddings and children of their own. Yellow sticky notes with near indecipherable scribble hung from each valuable Marie wanted saved. Items ranging from grandmother's coffee table to her late husband's pipe stand and pipes were all labeled, making the living room look like a ticker tape parade had come through. All of Wayne's clothes from his side of the closet were laid out neatly on the bed with strict instructions not to wrinkle. A wooden playpen and a box of old baby toys were also tagged. Marie had spent most of an emotional day categorizing her life. Every piece of furniture, knick-knack, and clothing had heart-wrenching sentimental value. The last instruction she had given to her youngest child, Don, was to rent a big moving truck because she wasn't leaving anything behind. The interior of Craig and Don's brand new Kia Forte glistened and reeked of new car smell. Craig catatonically followed a blue minivan with a back window full of family stick figures while Don fidgeted in her seat, cursing under her breath. Did you say something, hon? Asked Craig. Could you at least try to talk to me? Don scowled. I just did. You've done nothing but stare out the windshield with your mouth half open for the past 30 minutes. Sorry, I guess I was daydreaming, Craig said. I like the radio station you picked. It's making the trip go by a lot faster. Don exhaled loudly. Well, I don't. Then pick another one. This satellite radio is fantastic. It's got a channel for every taste. I'm sure glad I let the car dealer talk me into getting it. Dawn looked up on her husband with abhorrence, studying his awkward profile. From his small chin to his bigger than average nose, his inclined forehead, accented by bushy red eyebrows, seemed to slope back forever. She thought about Craig proposing 10 years earlier and the promise of a carefree life. He had been about to graduate from law school and had had job offers in both Chicago and St. Louis. All he'd had to do was pass the bar exam. Three failed attempts later, he gave up on his dream when the job offers dried up and instead became an insurance broker in Topeka. Dawn flipped down the visor and studied her own features in the mirror. Although her raven hair had hints of gray and the dark circles beneath her hazel eyes had become more pronounced, she still felt attractive and would dump Craig at the drop of a hat if a younger man with more sex drive happened along, as long as she didn't have to get a job. Craig made a decent enough living, so Don didn't have to. Well, that's one in your favor, Don mumbled. What's in my favor? Asked Craig. Oh, I was just thinking how glad I was that we waited to have kids. Craig smiled. You know, we're doing pretty well financially if you want to try. With my mother coming to live with us? Think of it. We'll have our very own built-in babysitter, Craig said. You're forgetting the reason why we have to pick her up. Oh, and by the way, you know she won't leave without a fight. I don't know why you didn't rent a truck when I told you to. There weren't any available in town, Craig said. As soon as the evac order was given, people made a run on U-Haul. The closest available truck for rent was in Columbia, Missouri. That's a three-hour trip one way in normal traffic. We wouldn't have been able to get to your mom's house until at least tomorrow with the way the roads were clogged. Don't worry. She'll blame me as always, Don pouted. You can never do anything wrong in her eyes, Craig. The entire family thinks you're a saint for marrying me. Why do you always say that? You know it's not true. Wayne, Kathy, and Barbara 
all have successful careers and wonderful families, Don mocked. They live in picture-perfect houses and live picture-perfect lives. And then there's me. I don't have a job, I didn't finish college, and I haven't given birth. Craig shook his head and laughed. Your brother and sisters are not that great. Wayne Jr. moved to Arizona right after college and has only visited a handful of times. Heck, he didn't even fly home for your father's funeral. Your sister Kathy's been divorced twice and has a restraining order against husband number three, and Barbara's kids all have felony records. Both of your sisters had excuses why they couldn't help your mom, and they live an hour closer than we do. She still treats me like I'm some kind of disease. I've seen a change in your mom after your father died. She doesn't have him to lean on anymore, and even though his life insurance more than paid off the house and car, there's a lot of stress in her life. What stress does my mother have? Playing bingo every Sunday? How many times has Barbara begged your mom for money this year so she could bail out Josh? And for that matter, how many times has Josh broken into your mom's house when she wasn't home? Josh has always been a bad kid, Don shrugged. <laughs> now he's a bad adult. Then there's Kathy and her axe murderer husband. She and her two little brats hid out at your mom's house for over a month without as much as a thank you or reimbursement for food, electricity, water. Alan is not an axe murderer. He may be abusive, but really, Craig? The traffic in Craig and Don's lane came to a dead stop while the left lane started to flow at normal speed. Instinctively, Craig checked his rear view and side view mirrors for an opening. Seeing his chance after an approaching SUV, he gripped the steering wheel tight and timed out the move in his head. You better not be changing lanes, Don warned. You know as soon as you do, the left lane will come to a stop and the right lane we were just in will start to move. I've got this, Craig said and then stuck out his tongue and smashed his foot down on the gas pedal. With a reckless and jerky move, he had the key of moving at 40 miles an hour, and then as quick as it had started, the flowing traffic slowed and then stopped altogether. Out of the corner of his eye, Craig caught the glare from his wife as the traffic in the right lane picked up speed. I hope you're happy now. You could have gotten us hit, Don yelled. At least I'm not following that minivan anymore. An hour and 17 miles further down the road, Don awoke to find they were once again in the right lane and following the same minivan covered in stick figures. In addition to changing lanes, Craig had also changed the satellite radio to the disco channel. The steady thump, thump, thump of the bass felt as if it were coming from the backside of her eyeballs. This is what you chose to listen to? Don griped. I know all the words to most of the songs, which helps me stay awake. How do you get the regular stations on this thing? Asked Don while searching for the FM button with her finger. I want to see if they have more news on the infestation nonsense. It's actually pretty serious. Those things seem to be everywhere now. Wichita is a virtual ghost town and Emporia State sent all of its students home after more than two dozen human remains were discovered on campus. There haven't been any attacks in Selena. Maybe people are panicking for nothing. The high-pitched emergency tone blaring from the car speakers caused both Craig and Don to flinch. Craig turned down the volume just as the National Emergency Mail Computer Simulated Voice started talking. Agitated, Don smacked Craig in the arm. Turn it up. I can't hear what he's saying. Not paying attention, Craig pushed the scan button. Maybe the other stations have the regular news on. Turn it back to that station. They were about to say something about Selena. I don't remember which one it was. Try the 90s. I think it was one of those. All right, calm down. I'll find it, Craig said. The sarcastic tone in his voice infuriated Don. I'm not going to calm down. We've been poking along this stupid highway, stuck behind the same soccer mom van for what seems like forever, and I'm going to pee my pants if we don't pull over soon. And what makes everything worse, my mother expected us over two hours ago. I can't seem to reach her, and she hasn't tried to call me. God only knows what's going on. Craig pumped his fist in the air. Found it! In and around the Smoky River area, the emergency broadcast said and then looped back to the beginning of the message. Doesn't your mom live by the river? asked Craig. Don waved her hand to get Craig to stop talking. Shh, be quiet. This is an emergency broadcast for Selena and the surrounding areas. The broadcast started. An evacuation notice has been given for the following counties. Dickerson, Marion, McPherson, and Selene. Blockades have been set east and west of the Smoky River. Please do not attempt to cross any of these barricades. To do so could result in serious injury or death. Do not approach any unknown animal. In the event you encounter one or more of the new species, remain in your car or residence. Evacuation signs have been placed 
at all major thoroughfares. Residents are encouraged to proceed with great urgency in and around the Smoky River area. A tritone rang out followed by a long, annoying buzz, and the report started again. How close does your mom live to the river? asked Craig. Don stared straight ahead with blurry eyes. Maybe a mile, maybe less? Crud, we're 20 miles away. We'll never get there before sunset at this rate. Bring the GPS up on your phone. I'm getting off at the next exit. Every time Marie thought she heard a truck outside, she would get anxious and move hastily to the living room windows to see if Don and Craig were driving down the street. Looking out at her deserted neighborhood, she felt like the last person on earth. Even the birds seemed to have left. Walking back to her chair where she had spent the last couple of hours waiting, Marie turned on the television and started surfing through the limited channel selections. After her husband had died, she couldn't find a reason to keep paying for cable television since she only watched the lower channels herself. So last Christmas, Don and Craig bought her a digital receiver and she had been planted in front of her 20-year-old boxy television ever since. The only station that wasn't airing the emergency broadcast warning was showing reruns of her favorite sitcoms from the 50s and 60s, which was fine with Marie. If she became tired of the news, modern-day TV shows, or just the dead silence of her old house, she would turn the TV to Channel 34, knowing she could always find an old friend no matter what show was on. Marie relaxed for the first time that day, giggling as Mr. Wilson chased Dennis the Menace inside of Mr. Wilson's house, pleading for him to stop right before there was a big crash. Through the roar of the canned laughter, Marie heard another crash. Thinking the sound had come from the television show, she paid no attention until she heard yet another crash. Marie muted the TV. The sound of glass breaking made her jump. The sound of her carousel horse jewelry box playing the familiar sweet tune Wayne used to whistle gave her shivers. Something was in Marie's bedroom. From her vantage point in the living room, she could see its shadowy outline milling about the foot of the bed. Filled with fear, the telephone hanging on the kitchen wall seemed miles away. The front door seemed closer, but if she ran outside to get away, there was no telling what might be waiting for her on the front porch. Marie had half-heartedly listened to the newscast describing the creatures and warning all residents to keep their distance. In Marie's mind, this tragedy was happening to someone else. The evacuation was just the unfortunate result of someone high on the food chain having too big of an imagination. Now she wished she had paid better attention. Keeping an eye on the doorway to her bedroom, Marie awkwardly rose out of her chair while whatever the thing was seemed to be engrossed in a cardboard box full of old shoes. She hurried over to the phone and uncradled it too hard, causing her to lose grip of the handpiece. When the hard plastic smacked against the linoleum floor, the thing in the bedroom paused and then scampered out into the hallway. Pulling on the twisted elastic cord, Marie hoisted up the handset like she was reeling in a wiggly fish. She dialed Don's number and held the phone up to her face, gripping it so hard that her fingers ached. Out from the dark hallway and into the evening sun-filled living room, a creature the size of a German shepherd appeared. Marie grabbed a tall bar stool and placed it in between her and the creature. Just as Dawn answered her phone, the creature rose up on its hind legs and growled, and Marie screamed. <laughs>